Admiral McRaven, welcome to the show. Thanks, good to be here. A couple years ago, you gave a commencement speech at the University of Texas. I'm an OU fan, so I don't know how we're going to do this here, but... um, <laughs> uh, We'll do just fine. We'll do fine. We'll take it out of the Red River rivalry. Right, right. Well, uh, this commencement speech you gave went viral, and then you've, you've come out of the book where you expand on this commencement speech you gave. And in the commencement speech, the thing that stuck home with a lot of people was this idea of making your bed can change the world. How so? How can making your bed and paying attention to the small details change the world? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I think uh, probably most of our parents raised us to kind of make our bed, and, and, and mine were no, no different. My mother was a teacher from Texas, and my father was a military officer. And, and growing up, you know, they always told me, you know, when I got up, make your bed. But I'm not sure I really understood why that was important. When I went to SEAL training, you know, here we were, you know, we'd come to SEAL training to become uh, you know, kind of battle-hardened SEALs. And, and in fact, the first thing we did every single day was we had a uniform inspection and we had a bed inspection. And, and it became clear as I went through training and frankly, as I went through the rest of my military career, why that was important. And the point was, one, it, it is the first task you do of the day. And if you do it well, it encourages you to do other tasks and other tasks and other tasks. And so it, it kind of starts your day off right. But the other part of this is, you know, little things matter. So for the SEAL instructors, you know, you were given, you know, very specific guidelines on how to make your bed. You know, you, you had to have hospital corners at a 45 degree angle. Your, your pillow had to be, you know, positioned uh, right at the, uh, the base of the headboard and right in the middle. The blanket had to be folded correctly. And, and they wanted to make sure that you did it to exacting standards. And their point was, look, if, if you can't even make your bed right, how are you ever going to run a SEAL mission? So in addition to it being the first task of the day, the fact of the matter was the little things in life matter. Do the little things well, and you'll end up doing the big things well, equally, equally well. And another point you made is that you're not going to get praise for these things. It's just something you have to do. No one's going to slap you on the back for making your bed or doing these small tasks. Right. Well, I, you know, part of SEAL training also was, you know, learning how to fail. But, but you're right. You know, routinely you would do something that was exceptional. Your uniform would look great. You know, your brass was great. Your shoes were polished. You had excelled. But the instructors didn't really care because, hey, that, that's the standard. You want to be great. This is what the expectation is. Don't expect somebody's going to come around and, and give you a participation trophy or a pat on the back. Do your job and do it to the very best that you can. So in one section, you talk about a parachuting accident you had. Can you tell us a bit about that and how you overcame that setback? Yeah, this was in 2001. We were going out for a, a routine training jump, free fall jump. And a beautiful California day in San Diego, we were, we were jumping from 12,999 feet to right below 13,000. And, and normally on a jump like that, you jump out about 5,000 feet, you, you look around, you, you wave off, as we say, to make sure the people around you know you're going to pull, and you pull your ripcord. Well, in that particular day, I, I jumped out, and everything was going fine. And as I got to about 5,500 feet, I looked below me, and there was a, a jumper had slid below me, so he was couple hundred feet below me and I realized that uh, I needed to move out of his way but I didn't move out fast enough he opened his parachute and in relative terms of course he was coming up while I was going down so I hit his parachute as he was moving upward in relative motion I spun around kind of knocked me you know a little bit I don't want to say completely knocked me out but it, it dazed me I didn't know where I was uh, in, in terms of distance to the ground so I pulled my parachute, and when I pulled the ripcord, the pilot chute wrapped around one leg and the riser around the other, and, and I, w I was falling, and my parachute had not opened. So as I'm falling kind of head first to the ground, tangled up in the parachute, uh, the good news was the parachute opened. Now, the bad news was when it opened, it was wrapped around my legs, and it basically just yeah, broke my body in half, uh, one leg going one way, one leg going the other, and so broke my pelvis, uh, ripped the muscles out of my stomach, broke part of my back. But the, the point in the book was that, you know, I, I had to recuperate, uh, had to recover. And as tough as I was, and I was in command of all the SEALs on the West Coast at the time, and I'd had a lot of uh, incidents in my life that were kind of near life threatening, but I'd always managed to get out of them, but, but not this time. And so as I kind of lay in my hospital bed, it took a lot of people to kind of get me up out of that bed to save my career. I mean, my wife ended up doing uh, nursing duties. Uh, my boss, Admiral Eric Olson, helped me in my career. Friends came by. And, and, you know, you realize at that point in time that I don't care how tough you are, you know, you need other people to help you make it through life. And so that was a little bit of the moral of that story. But I will also tell you that, 
you know, my accident pales in comparison to the injuries and the wounds that I saw in combat in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places. I mean, these young men and women today, the, the wounds that they suffer from IEDs and from gunshot wounds, you know, put it all in perspective. But, but even those folks, you know, when that happens, we all need a little bit of help making it, uh, making it through life. Well, I'm sure, was that hard for you? You know, I'm, I'm sure it's hard for a lot of soldiers who are very self-reliant and want to pull their weight. Was that hard for you to take help? Yeah, it was. Uh, again, I had been, as you point out, self-reliant for my whole life and my whole career. And then all of a sudden, you know, I, I can't even walk. I mean, I need somebody to get me out of bed. I need somebody to change my bedpan. I need, you know, a physical therapist to come by. My career looked like it was over. I needed somebody to kind of get my career back on track. So all of a sudden you realize that there are a whole lot of people out there at the end of the day that you are probably relying on whether you know it or not. But when you have an event like that, an accident like that, you begin to find out who those people are and you're very, very appreciative of, of everything they do to to take care of it. So in, throughout the book, you talk about uh, SEAL training, and one aspect of SEAL training is sugar cookies. What are the sugar cookies, and what did the sugar cookies teach you about being resilient? Well, the sugar cookie is a, the sugar cookie is a term we use when you are required to go jump in the ocean, so jump in the surf zone, uh, and you're in full uniform. So back then we wore these green utility uniforms. You go jump in the, in the surf zone, and then you come back and on the beach, and you roll around in the sand until you are covered head to toe in sand, therefore the, the term sugar cookie. But the point about the sugar cookie that, that really bothered a lot of the trainees, the students, was that it was very arbitrary. So there were certain events when you failed an event, a timed run or a timed swim, you knew you had failed it, and therefore you knew that there would be some sort of you know, accountability and, and, and uh, harassment and punishment to follow. But in the case of the sugar cookie, sometimes it was just if an instructor didn't like you, if the instructor just didn't think something was right, you could become a sugar cookie. And the arbitrariness of it bothered a lot of the students. So there were days, I remember a young officer that was with me, he would always have a perfect uniform. The hat was perfectly starched, the uniform looked great, his brass was polished, the boots shined. But every morning he would be told to get a sugar cookie, uh, to be, you know, go jump in the surf and roll around. And he just didn't understand it. And the point the instructors were trying to make was, hey, look, life's not fair. You know, some days uh, you are perfect, you give everything you've got, and life still punches you in the gut. So uh, this was the, I think, the lesson they were trying to teach is, hey, get over it, don't wallow in self-pity, you know, you're better than that, uh, just just keep moving forward. Yeah, I'm sure that's an important mindset for a SEAL to have, because you can do everything right on a mission, but things out of your control just break up your plans. So another aspect of SEAL training was the circus, which also seemed like unfair and terrible. So what's the circus in SEAL training and, and what did that teach you about becoming stronger? The circus was a little different in that the circus was actually a function of whether you failed an event. So if you didn't make a timed run, if you didn't make your swim on time or you came in last in a swim, then the circus was generally an additional, you know, one and a half to two hours of additional physical training at the end of every day. The hard part about the circus was you would go all day doing physical training. So, I mean, you'd start off the morning early with a long run and then a long swim and then an obstacle course and then more calisthenics. I mean, that was the nature of the average day at SEAL training. Then when everybody went home, if you'd made the circus list, then you had an additional two hours. And the problem is the next day you would come in, you'd be exhausted, and invariably you wouldn't make the run time again. And so it could become a bit of a death spiral in terms of your ability to, you know, to hang tough and you know, to kind of get over these failures. And a lot of the students, again, had trouble uh, realizing that I'm never going to get out of this death spiral because every day it looks like I fail another event, I'm back in another, uh, in another circus. But what we found, uh, my swim buddy Mark Thomas and I found that, and while we weren't in the, the circuses every day, we were in enough of them, and if you did the additional two hours, you know, if you failed and then you were held responsible, but you worked through it, you had more push-ups, more pull-ups, more sit-ups, you actually became stronger. And the point of the message was sometimes failure can make you stronger. If you learn from the lessons, uh, if you hang in there and just keep pushing through the failure, at the end of the day, you, you come out on the other end. And I, I tell the story of Mark Thomas and I, who were not particularly a good uh, swim pair, uh, we were almost always invariably last in the swims, so we would find ourselves frequently at the circuses. But on the very last swim of the SEAL training, we ended up being first. 
And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that, you know, Mark and I had a lot of extra physical training. How'd you push yourself through that, you know, when you're going to circus after circus? Like, how do you, is it just pure grit? You just got to find something inside of you to keep going? Because I'm sure a lot of guys give up. I'm sure a lot of guys ring the bell when they got caught in the circus. Well, that's exactly right, because I, I think they, they realize that, my gosh, I am in this death spiral. If I have to go two or three circuses in a row, will I ever be able to make it? And so a lot of them did ring the bell. And I, I think it's like anything else in SEAL training or in life. You know, we're all going to have tough times. Point is, you have to work through them. You just don't quit. It's not rocket science. It's not deeply profound. You just don't quit. And, uh, and again, whether it's SEAL training or something else in life, you know, it, we're all going to get stuck in the circus at some point in time. You know, hang in there. Uh, work through the tough times and, and you'll be fine on the other end of it. So there's a section you, you titled Be Your Very Best in the Darkest Occasions. You've gone through some dark occasions, uh, you know, your parachute accident, and you've also had to, you know, you're in charge of the SEALs and you, I'm sure you, you were in charge of uh, missions where you know, men died or injured. How do, you, how do you stay your best in those dark moments when all you want to do is, you know, wallow in self-pity, moan and groan? I mean, are there any tactics you use to just keep your best? Yeah, I think this is a recognition that in all of us, there is something inside of us. I'm convinced that you know, every man and woman has it within them to rise to the occasion in these dark moments. And the point of the story was, I've seen this. I've seen it time and time and time again when families came together, when you know, brothers who lost brothers stepped up to, to help their, you know, the, the mother and father who had had to go through this terrible tragedy. Um, entire towns came out when a young ranger was killed, and, and, and you saw people rising to the occasion in their dark moments. And so this is not something I think you can, you can't train for it. I don't know that anybody can teach you how to, to do well in a dark moment. The point is, I think you have to realize that we all have it within us to overcome those dark moments. And you have to dig deep to find it, but I think it's in every one of us. And, and I've seen it in, you know, young men, young ladies who overcome terrible tragedies and keep going, and they are the last people maybe you would have expected to rise to the occasion, but they do. Because uh, I'm convinced it, it's been put inside all of us, and you just have to look hard for it. That leads to the one section you talk about uh, providing hope as a leader. You know, when all seems hopeless, I guess part of that is just setting the example because courage is contagious. Exactly right. I, I talk about in the book, you know, start singing when you're up to your neck in mud. And that, that refers to an event called Hell Week that we have as we go through training. And uh, back in the day when I went through, uh, they had these things called the mud flats. And the mud flats were, you know, three or four feet deep of mud. And so you, you would have to sit in the mud and, and you were up to your neck in mud. And it was cold and it was wet. And it was, they generally had this about the third day of Hell Week. So Hell Week was, for us, six days of no sleep, constant harassment by the instructors to weed out those that really didn't want to be SEALs. And, and, and the third day of Hell Week was down at the mud flats. And so by this time, you haven't slept in a couple of days and you're right on the beach. So the wind is howling and it's cold. And I remember at one point in time, we're all in the mud, and it's dark outside, and the instructor came up, and he, uh, he, and he had a cup of coffee in his hand, and there was a fire nearby, and, and a couple of the other instructors were hanging around the fire, and he said, hey, look, this is easy, guys. He said, you, why don't you all come on out? Uh, look, you know, you've got a cup of coffee here. We even have some chicken soup. You kind of sit by the fire. It's all easy, easy. All I need is for five of you to quit. If five of you quit, then the rest of the class can come on out here and and, and, of course, he was baiting the class, but there were a couple of, there was a guy right next to me. We were all, you know, had arms linked, and I remember the guy next to me starting to, to bolt. He was, he was ready to have that cup of coffee in the fire, and, uh, and then one of the trainees started singing. And I'm often asked, uh, what was the song? And I've told people, not a song I can repeat in, in mixed company or in public. But having said that, it, it created other, you know, others started singing as well. The instructors, of course, got mad. And so we ended up staying in the, in the mud uh, for, you know, another hour or so. We did not get out and get our, our cup of coffee. But the point was that one individual gave the rest of us hope. And I think in the book I talk about uh, General John Kelly, who is now the Secretary of uh, Homeland Security. And, uh, and he had lost his son in combat. And, uh, and I watched as he and others, but he in particular, we all had to go to Dover to greet the families 
who had uh, loved ones that were killed uh, when we had a helicopter shoot down in Afghanistan. And John Kelly was able to talk to these families in a way that nobody else could. And all of those, all of us, uh, us around him, you know, we were inspired by how he inspired the families and how he and his wife, you know, overcame this terrible tragedy that they had to deal with. And so, you know, one person can truly make a difference, uh, whether you're, you know, a John Kelly or whether you're, you know, a guy stuck in the mud flats. So well, speaking of people who can make a difference, uh, one guy you highlight in your book is a former SEAL, uh, Tommy Norris. Can you tell us a little bit about him and the lessons he taught you? Well, Tommy Norris is a great story because uh, if you were to meet Tommy Norris on the street, uh, you might not give him a second look. He's a, a medium stature, kind of small framed, not the kind of guy you would think of as you know a big, tough Navy SEAL. And the story I tell in the book is the first time I, I met uh, Tommy Norris, I was, I was at the SEAL compound, the headquarters. I was a senior in college, and I was going there just to, to do a quick, uh, have a quick discussion with one of the SEAL instructors to find out what training was all about. And I looked down the hall, and I, I saw this fellow down the hall, again, small-framed uh, individual. And, and I, in my own mind, I was thinking, does this guy really think he could be a Navy SEAL? Because yeah, my impression was all Navy SEALs were, you know, six foot two or six foot four, you know, 220 pounds, muscle bound, and I remember thinking this poor guy because he was looking at pictures of Vietnam era SEALs. It wasn't until later that morning, when all of a sudden I was introduced to him, and the introduction was, "Bill, this is Tommy Norris. He was the last SEAL Medal of Honor recipient from Vietnam." And, of course, you realize that, well, yeah, I think this guy will make it through SEAL training. Not only will he make it through SEAL training, he went on to be one of the, one of the legends in the community. And, uh, and, of course, went on to be on the FBI's hostage rescue team as well. And the point was, it's easy to mistake folks. It's really all about your heart. It doesn't have anything to do with how fast you are, how strong you are. You know, it, it's all in your heart. With Tommy Norris, you know, he was one of the gutsiest guys in the history of the SEAL teams, but but also one of the one of the more modest, humble guys you'll ever meet. Love that. So, last question before we go: uh, In the everyone knows about the iconic bell at SEAL training. You know, you ring it and you're out. What do you tell the folks who have their own? There's a, their own bell, whatever that is in their life, and they're just so tempted to ring it. How do you stop yourself from ringing it when everything in you wants to do that? Well, when when we go through SEAL training, a lot of times we we have this philosophy of take it one evolution at a time. The the philosophy is you start off, you're going to become a frogman. You know, Navy SEAL is a frogman from the World War II days. So you start off as a tadpole, and you are evolving from a tadpole to a frogman. So we call them evolutions. They're, they're separate events. And what happens a lot of times is, you know, the, the, the students will look too far down the event horizon. So they'll wake up in the morning, and of course, the first thing you do is an hour and a half of calisthenics and you're tired and, and you're exhausted and you're looking at that bell because it's in the compound. It's in the, the courtyard where we do our physical training and it's, it seems to be ever present. And if at that point in time, when you are the most tired, you look at that bell and you say, gosh, almighty, you know, uh, the, the next evolution we have is going to be a long run. And then after that, we're going to have a long swim. And then after that, we're going to do an obstacle course. And then after that, you see those those students didn't make it. They saw the bell, and they just decided that they couldn't keep going. And sometimes it's important to realize that you take it one event at a time. Uh, you're going to have difficult times in your life. Uh, try not to look too far down the road. Just handle the problem as it is right now. Get over that, and then you'll have the energy. You'll have the the inspiration, the fortitude to keep going. And And I remember very early on in training, you know, one of the instructors came out, and he was kind of very uh, pro forma, if you will. He said, you know, gentlemen, uh, you know, you're here in the toughest military training in the world, and all you have to do to quit is, is ring this bell. And, you know, if you quit, you won't have to do the long runs. You won't have to do the long swims anymore. And then I remember he, he clearly kind of, you know, broke form, and he, and he was a Navy SEAL. And he looked at all of us, and there were about 150 or 55 of us when we started. And he said, but, gentlemen, let me tell you something. If you quit, you will regret it for the rest of your life. And I think he was right. And I think if you're pursuing anything, I don't care what you're pursuing. If you want to be a doctor or a lawyer or a great musician or whatever you want to do in life, you know, there are going to be times when you get beaten down, when you don't think you're going to make it. 
you just don't quit. And that bell will be in front of every person at some point in time in their life. And when you see it, just realize that just keep going, put the bell behind you, and, and life will work out if you just don't quit. Well, Admiral McRaven, this has been a fantastic conversation. Where can people find out more about your book? Uh, well, thanks. So, well, you know, the, the book's on sale at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all the other uh, distributors. It's called uh, Make Your Bed. And, and I'm, I'm happy that, that uh, you know, pe- I think people will find it inspiring because it's about the people that inspired me. And, and there are a lot of them out there. You know, I, I talk in my last story about Adam Bates, a young man who lost both of his legs, but he represents every single soldier, sailor, airman, and marine that, uh, that ever served that had to go through tough times. But, of course, it's, it's not just those in the military. Like I said, we all encounter tough times at some point in time. I'm hoping that the, this, this small book called Make Your Bed will, will help people when they encounter those tough times. Admiral McRaven, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Uh, The pleasure's mine. Thank you very much. My guest today was Admiral William McRaven. He is the author of the book, Make Your Bed, Little Things That Can Change Your Life and Maybe the World. It's available on Amazon.com. It's a great book for college grads. Even if you're not a college grad, go pick this book. It'll leave you fired up. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash makeyourbed, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.